All right. So um, first of all, I have to um, uh, talk a bit on, on the fact that I'm actually in the process of um, moving towards my defense of my PhD. So my, uh, the defense is in uh, one and a half months on the 1st of May. So this is why uh, I'm a bit uh, in the process of editing and uh, rewriting and so on and so on um, and layouting. And so I'm, I'm, um, what I'm going to talk about now is actually one of the chapters that's in the larger volume of, of uh, the PhD of the, of the manuscript, which talks in general talks about the position of the artist, uh, the role of the artist in an automated society, in a, a society that's, um, um, that's influenced very uh, strongly by uh, information technology and, and digital, uh, and the digital environment. So basically what we're also experiencing now um, and so um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a reading of, uh, of this chapter, which is called uh, Remembering. Um, okay, so it starts off uh, with this quote by David Lowenthal, to be is to have been, and to project our messy, malleable past into our unknown future. Computation's recreation of the past in the future relies on the rationalization of memory which determines our understanding of what the totality of information means exactly. Memory in the automated world has a different meaning than human memory, yet it is the conflation of these two meanings that generates the replicating capabilities of computation. For a clear example of the way memory is dealt with in the greedy archives of computation, we can look at Borges' 1942 story, Funes de Memorias. In the story, the narrator recalls an encounter with a mysterious character called Ireneo Funes, who was able to remember everything he had ever seen or experienced. And I quote, with one quick look, you and I perceived three wine glasses on the table. Funes perceived every grape that had ever been pressed into the wine and all the stalks and tendrils of its vineyard. He knew the forms of the clouds in the Southern sky on the morning of April 30th, 1882, and, compare, and could compare them in his memory with the veins in the marble bindings of a book he had seen only once, or with the feathers of a spray lifted by an oar on the Rio Negro on the eve of the Battle of Quebrancho. Nor were those memories simple. Every visual image was linked to a muscular sensation, thermal sensation, and so on. He was able to reconstruct every dream, every daydream he ever had, Two or three times he had reconstructed an entire day. He had never once erred or faltered, but every reconstruction had itself taken an entire day. I myself alone have more memories than all mankind since the world began, he said to me. And also, my dreams are like other people's waking hours. And again, towards dawn, my memory, sir, is like a garbage heap. A circle drawn on a blackboard, a right triangle, a rhombus. These are forms that we can fully intuit. Ireneo could do the same with the stormy mane of a young colt, a small herd of cattle on a mountainside, a flickering fire or its, and its uh, uncountable ashes, and the many faces of a dead man at the wake. I have no idea how many stars he saw in the sky. So Finesse's ability to remember, remember, or more accurately, his inability to forget, allows him to accumulate and recollect strings of experiences so fine-grained that near to no cognitive gaps need to be filled in through inductive means. Like Bergson's definitions of, definition of change as a continuous and dynamic whole, Finesse's memory is non-intermittent and indivisible resulting in an overwhelming resolution which permits the comparison of hypothetical apples to oranges. It becomes clear that to harvest the totality of information, the storage of this information needs to come first and it needs to be executed with infinite detail. Finesse, reg Finesse registers every sensation, every movement and every vision into the logbooks of his brain. They are immediately available to him at every instance his body is a mobile recording device, needing only a glance at an object to have it captured and stored and carried within forever. The baseline of computation is a capacity for memory like this. 
if a machine forgets nothing, then it scans the world and the situation of the universe result in a comprehension of totality. All the angles would be seen, all the sounds heard, all the movements registered. Even if it takes some time before everything is logged, the unforgetting memory would collect and safeguard all data until the totality is achieved, uh, slowly filling in the seemingly endless blank. The retrieval of this data would, uh, from the archives and subsequent comparison with other data then allows to find overlaps and similarity or produce an impression of an even denser, denser resolution, layer upon layer, map upon map. Just as finesse can compare the southern clouds to a splash of water, placing them virtually next to each other, so can computation place sound next to image, metadata next to movement. However, absolute memory warrants not only the comparison between incomparable differences, but between similarities, even likenesses. Finesse, confront, finesse, confronted with the generalizing logic of the average mind, is baffled by the banality of perception, by the simplifying and compar compartmentalizing processes people use to grasp the complex. He is, in fact, unable to combine two or more experiences as being alike. Finesse, we must not forget, was virtually incapable of general platonic, platonic ideas. Not only was it difficult for him to see that the generic symbol dog took in all the dissimilar individuals of all shapes and sizes, it irritated him that the dog of, four, of 314 in the afternoon seen in profile should be indicated by the same noun as the dog of 315 seen frontally. What does the comparison between incomparable differences achieve if it is unable to group or and read abstract similarities? In computational thinking, similarities are referred to as patterns, which is a way to describe recurring sequences or strings of data from different sources. To find a pattern is to lay the sequences on top of each other and note both similarities and differences, which which pixel or group of pixels accords with another, which wavelength synchronizes with another, which quantified representation of reality matches with another. This understanding is similar in its, in, uh, is, uh, this understanding of similarity is entirely different from what Borges defines as similarity. Indeed, the dog seen from the side on a sunny day and then seen frontally on a cloudy day is visually not the same dog. Yet in human perception, leaving out the differences entirely and only focusing on the similarities, the dog is considered one and the same, regardless of the time passing or the weather changing or the angle of view shifting. It is in this sense that the percep perception of computation based on a flawless and complete memory differs from the faulty and messy mind of mankind. To put it in Borges's words, to ignore is to forget. Uh, to think is to ignore or forget differences, to generalize, to, ex to abstract. And as, and, and as computers are incapable of forgetting or ignoring, their vision of the world remains particular, built up from endless and immediate particulars. Bergson describes the same process of abstraction in a different way. He assumes that our mind is indeed capable of perceiving particulars, but that the breaking up of the continuity into particulars, into intervals, allows the mind to bring certain events to the front and send others to the back. When two changes, that of the object and that of the subject, take place under particular conditions, they produce the particular appearance that we call a state. And once in possession of states, our mind recomposes change with them. There is nothing more natural the breaking up of change into states enables us to act upon things. And it is useful in a practice, practical sense to be interested in the states rather than the change itself. Like computation, which breaks down change into particulars, into states or better into fixed numbers, human perception cuts the continuous flow of information into befores and afters. Computation, however, is unable to select, to choose between these states. By adding more and more states to the memory without deleting what is in between, 
perception re reaches a point at which it reconstructs the graduality of change again, like a camera producing 24 images and placing them so tightly together that the difference between the images blurs into a continuous movement. The human mind selects first by breaking up the flow of changes into states and then by isolating specific states and wide out others. The facts show us, and I quote Bergson again, the facts show us in normal psychological life, a constant effort of the mind to limit its horizon, to turn away from what it has a material interest in not seeing. Before philosophizing, one must live. And life demands that we put on blinders, that we look neither to the left, nor to the right, nor behind us, but straight ahead in the direction we have to go. Our knowledge, far from being made up of a gradual association of simple elements, is the effect of a sudden dissociation from the immediately vast, from the, from the immensely vast field of our virtual knowledge we have selected in order to make it into actual knowledge, everything which concerns our actions upon things. We have neglected the rest. The brain seems to have been constructed with a view to this work of selection that could be easily shown by the way in which memory works. Our past is necessarily automatically preserved. It, serves, it survives complete, but our practical interest is to thrust it aside or at least to accept it, upset, or at least to accept of it only what can more or less be usefully, uh, more or less usefully illuminate and complete the situation in the present. The brain serves to bring about this choice. Choice. It actualizes the useful memories. It keeps in the lower strata of the consciousness those which are of no use. One could say as much for perception. Forgetting permits agency and knowledge. It hereby keeps us sane as the totality of information would bewilder us as it does to finesse. And I quote Borges again. Finesse could continually perceive the quiet advances of corruption, of tooth decay, of weariness. He saw, he noticed the progress of death, of humidity. He was a solitary, lucid spectator of a multiform, momentaneous and almost unbearable, precise world. Babylon, London and New York dazzle mankind's imagination with their fierce splendor. No one in the populous towers or urgent avenues of those cities has ever felt the heat and the pressure of a reality as inexhaustible as that which bettered Ireneo day and night in his poor South American hinterland. The totality of information, however, does not bewilder computational devices. Bewilderment is a human trait, inextricably connected to the limitations of the human mind. Yet it is the same limitations which allows me to compare Borges's fiction to the philosophy of Bergson, written 30 years apart and numerous decades before my birth. My ability to forget permits me to see similarity in the text written of the same language by selecting that which is relevant and leaving out that which is not. It permits me to block out the context in which both texts were written, which backgrounds both writers had, it supports my mission to create new insights or new interpretation. What it does not permit me to do is to compare these texts to the structural integrity of a skyscraper or to the average yearly flow of the Nile Basin. It does not allow me to capture the total amount of characters used in both text, text and compare them to the history of every text ever written, which is indeed a possibility for computation. It is the dynamic of forgetting, reinterpreting, and re-embodying that creates not only the individual memory, but history in general. That is the collection of past experiences and the selection of the memory of the memories captioning those experiences. The limitation active in the human mind is also one that is mirrored by the succession of generations in a community. Next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. People don't, uh, do not just forget, they also die, perhaps the most extreme form of forgetting. Their experiences are lost, or when written down or registered otherwise, unprotected by their originator, 
and thus again open to interpretation. The past inescapably recedes away from the present, taking with it the ideas and memories of those who have passed away. All that is left are the traces they leave behind, either in direct transmission to another or in another physical form. Normalization is intrinsically a fictionalization from the past projected into the future, a narrative built on the ruins of bygone days, solidified in the collective memory as a given. It, its origin is forgotten, irretrievably lost in the inevitable progression of time, which forces memories to fade and generations to pass. The process that forms normalizations is therefore based on the same selective procedure performed by the brain. To make sense of the residue of the past, we include some traces and sources and leave out others, creating a consistent whole with a logical, reasonable narrative. Historian David Lowenthal describes this relationship to the past as a visit to a foreign country where the similarities of differences and differences are extracted selectively from experience and subsequently in internalized as normal to straighten out this unknown territory. The past itself is gone. All that survives is its material residues and the accounts of those who experience it. No such evidence can tell us about the past with absolute certainty for its survivals on the ground in books or in our heads are selectively preserved from the start and further altered with the passage of time. These remnants conform too well with one another and with knowledge of the present to be denied all validity, yet residual doubts about the past's reality help to account for our eagerness to accept what may be dubious about it. There can be no certainty that the past ever existed, let alone in the form we now conceive it, but sanity and security require us to believe that it did. Interpreting the past as a way to avoid its complexity or escape its inexhaustible heat and pressure, like for Funes, by cognitively knitting together and selection, uh, a selection of the remnants is not only what keeps us sane, but also what allows us to take a glimpse through the experience of hindsight at what may be to come. It provides a sense of security, of certainty by infusing the narrative with present conformities, we highlight similarities. When what happens now has happened in the past, it reassures us of the outcome. So Lowenthal continues. continues. Uh, As modes of access to the past, memory, history, and relics exhibit important resemblances and differences. By nature, by its nature, personal and hence largely unverifiable, memory extends back only to childhood. Uh, though we do accrete to our own recollections those told us by forebears. By contrast, history, whose shared data and conclusions must be open to public scrutiny, extends back to or beyond the earliest records of civilization. The death of each individual totally extinguishes countless memories, whereas history, or at least in print, is potentially immortal. Yet all histories depends on memory, yet all history depends on memory, and many recollections incorporate history. And, and they are alike distorted by selective perception, intervening circumstance, and hindsight. So history here, as immortal as it may seem, grows distorted and fluid as time passes. The documentation of past events, however prone to entropy, is reinterpreted at every possible instant, instance through the selective and seemingly random process of perception. As the documentation is never complete and total, and as that which is, document is dis documented is dispersed again by future generations, it, the past becomes malleable. Computation's approach to memory, however, and therefore history, goes beyond interpretation. Computation annuls distortion by selective perception or hindsight, putting in place a neutrality based on the comprehension of this totality of the past. So the potential immortality of history made it manifest. Forgetting is completely ignored by computation. And for philosopher Byun Chul Han, marks the difference. 
Human memory is a narrative, an account. Forgetting forms a necessary component. In contrast, digital memory is a matter of seamless addition and accumulation. Stored data admit counting, but they, do, but they cannot be recounted. Storage and retrieval, retrieval are fundamentally different from remembering, which is a narrative process. Likewise, autobiography constitutes a narrative. It is a memorial writing. A timeline, on the other hand, recounts nothing. It simply enumerates and adds up events and or information. The dream of computation begins to unravel once we frame it as the fictionalization that it is, as it is, as is the case with any automation and the promises that comes with then the promises that come with it. The idea that the scale of the totality of information, if it ever could be ascertained, would be of any use to us all, uh, would be of any use at all to us, is formally untrue. In Borges's story, Funes had reconstructed an entire day th two or three times, and he had never once erred or faltered, but each reconstruction had itself taken an entire day. Totality, likewise, takes totality to operate. So if no cropping of information is made and no conclusion can be drawn, an assimilation which we create is no different from reality itself. This reminds us of another story by Borges, only the length of a paragraph. In that empire, the art of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city and the map of the empire, the entirety of a province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied and the cartographer's guild struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire and which coincided point for point with it. The following generations who had not been so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears, forebears had been saw that the vast map was useless and not without some pitilessness was it that they delivered it up to the inclemencies of sun and winter. In the deserts of the West, still today, there are tattered ruins of that map inhabited by animals and beggars. In all the land, there are no other relics of the disciplines of geography. Thank you.